What's going on everyone? Welcome back to my channel and another Oscars 2022 video. First we ranked all the best international feature nominees as well as the best animated feature nominees, but today we're ranking all 10 of the best picture nominees. So let me know in the comments what your ranking of the best picture nominees are. As always, this is just my list and not a definitive ranking. And to be clear, similar to the other two lists, I actually liked all 10 of these movies. I gave them all at least a 7 out of 10, and while I may not love all of them, I think they're all worth watching. But also make sure to hit that thumbs up button if you like these videos, as it helps me out immensely by getting my content out there. And if you're new here, I hope you consider hitting that subscribe button so you can stay up to date with more movie related content on a near daily basis. But let's not waste any more time and let's jump into the list. At number 10, Belfast. The initial front runner for Best Picture has been described by some as Kenneth Branagh's Roma for its semi-autobiographical story set against real world conflicts in a restrained black and white style. And while I'm glad Branagh was able to get such a deeply personal story out there, and I do think it can be emotionally resonant at times, I wouldn't exactly call this best of the year material, though it is good. The cast all do a great job, with Jude Hill being a major stand out, along with Jamie Dornan and Catriona Belfi as his parents also being strong. And I love how organic all the exchanges felt, especially with some of the inherently funny conversations of kids just being kids. However, with the entire film taking place through a child's eyes, it does lead to a few more emotional moments, feeling oversimplified, and they don't have quite as much of an emotional impact as they should have. There are moments that have this nice sense of wonder and awe that I loved, but on the opposite end of that, some moments that should have had more weight to them felt stunted, especially due to its restrained style. I still think the good outweighs the bad, but I just wouldn't call it great. At number 9, King Richard, the sports biopic starring Will Smith in what will most likely result in him winning Best Actor, does feature quite possibly one of his best performances in some time. Smith captures Richard's commitment really well, to the point where we can't help but be fascinated by him, even when he's acting too overbearing or out of line. Plus, there are some great performances in the supporting cast, particularly from Anjanou Ellis and John Bernthal. However, Beyond the performances, I really wouldn't say this amounts to much beyond being just another sports biopic. Now yeah, there's a crowd-pleasing feel to it that will most certainly satisfy those who love these sort of movies, but regarding its structure, it just follows the same tropes of both the sports movie genre as well as the average biopic. And I mean, I get it. This is a true story, and the film's just telling it the way it happened, especially since Serena and Venus Williams are executive producers and they signed off on all this. But considering I'm someone who's not a die-hard sports movie fan or a biopic fan, and I tend to get a little tired of those tropes a little quicker, I wound up respecting it and I enjoyed watching it, but because of how closely it plays into said tropes, it wound up being nothing I loved. At number 8 is Drive My Car, and everything from here on out I thought was great. This is a film that I was almost certain I thought was just going to be okay in my book going in. It's a three hour, dialogue heavy film centered around grief. Typically, not what I immediately gravitate towards, so consider me shocked when I found myself really coming to enjoy this. Despite a focus on heavier subject matter, I found the conversations and monologues to be consistently engaging. The scenes of our two main characters opening up to one another were very therapeutic in nature without ever coming off like your typical exposition dumps, and I also particularly enjoy the sequences of our lead directing a play as I just naturally enjoy film centered around the arts, and I found these sequences in particular to be a nice way to cut some of the tension from time to time. There's a tender feel in Ryosuke Hamaguchi's direction, and I also thought it was powerfully acted. I don't quite think it needed to be three hours necessarily, and while for the most part I didn't feel that runtime, there were exceptions here and there, but for the most part, it's a lot more absorbing than I thought it would be, and it moved at a much quicker pace than I ever would have thought, just for how much I was invested in these characters, and it made for a great watch. At number 7, Nightmare Alley, probably the most surprising entry on this list, as this was not making a lot of people's predictions in this category. While I wouldn't say it matches the heights of Guillermo del Toro's previous film, the Best Picture winner The Shape of Water, I still really enjoy this. The main thing I'd have against it is that a lot of these characters are pretty terrible people to be perfectly honest, but all the performances are so mesmerizing, in particular from Bradley Cooper and Kate Blanchett, that you're still wrapped up in their 
every move, with a lot of great twists and turns. I'm also just a sucker for films that pay tribute to classic cinema or just older styles of filmmaking in general, and with this having previously been adapted once before in the 1940s, I just loved how Del Toro captures the feel of classic film noir from its slick cinematography, as well as its lavish costume design. So the edit style, while not my primary reason for enjoying this movie, was definitely a nice touch. I think like Drive My Car, it does fall into the category of being a tad too long, but for the most part, it's a thoroughly engrossing watch and another win for El Toro. At number 6, Dune. Denis Villeneuve's adaptation of a seemingly unfilmable novel is a home run for the director and has now kicked off what's sure to be a new major franchise that will have a dedicated following. The film's biggest boasting point is that from a technical standpoint, it's out of this world. Villeneuve's direction is stunning, the visuals are breathtaking, the costume designs are superb, and Hans Zimmer's score is something to behold. And what's great is how the screenplay manages to take such a dense, richly layered story with so much lore to it and make it all easy to digest for all audiences without oversimplifying anything or coming off like these sluggish exposition dumps. We feel truly immersed in this world and we're left wanting more. Which leads to my one big criticism of the film and what prevented me from putting it even higher on the list. It feels very noticeably incomplete and I understand it's only one part of a two-part story, and I probably will enjoy this more once we get that second part. But there are arcs introduced in this film that don't feel like they're left at a point I'd call the most satisfying, which you do at least get in other films that are meant to be two or even three parts. It kind of just stops, and while I am looking forward to seeing more, I just wish that it felt more like a conclusion to this chapter rather than just an abrupt stop. Like I said, I'll probably like it even more when we get to part two, but as it stands, I can't put it higher on this list, though it's still really, really good. At number five, The Power of the Dog. The current frontrunner for this category is another one that I would have thought would rank lower on this list. From what I've seen of Jane Campion's previous films, while I've enjoyed them, I wouldn't call myself a diehard fan of hers, and slow burn dramas in general are ones I feel like I have to be in the right mood for. But with this, I love the psychological aspect, with a mesmerizing performance by Benedict Cumberbatch in what's easily his most sinister role probably of all time, and this is easily one of my favorite performances of his, period. I also love the screenplay and the way it really explored several characters' psyches, in particular those of Cumberbatch and especially Kirsten Dunst, in what's a welcome return to the big screen for her as she has to deal with this torment by Cumberbatch and find a way to keep herself sane. On top of that, Campion's direction, as well as the cinematography, are both outstanding, with some beautiful wide shots while also still capturing this sense of claustrophobia of both Dunst and Cody Smith McPhee, as they feel trapped with Cumberbatch's menacing antagonist. The slow burn approach can be felt a few times, but that would be the exception and not the rule, as it's otherwise a really engrossing story. At number 4, West Side Story, the second adaptation of the musical of the same name, this time from Steven Spielberg, is actually an improvement over the Best Picture winning original. The film feels like Spielberg's love for older cinema, in particular big event films from the 60s, as the visual aesthetic and score recreate the feel of films from that time period wonderfully. And all the music was just fantastic, with renditions of songs like Tonight, I Feel Pretty, and so many more being just as iconic as their original versions. Probably one of my favorite parts about this, though, are the performances from so many up-and-coming cast members. Rachel Zegler and Ariana DeBose were easily the two highlights for me, though everyone else from Mike Feist to David Alvarez were also great, as was returning cast member of the original film, Rita Moreno. It's one of Spielberg's finest works of his most recent output, and the masterful craft on display is a big reason why I love musicals. At number three, Don't Look Up. Probably the most divisive of all the Best Picture nominees, with people either calling it one of the best movies of the year or one of the absolute worst movies of the year. It's the only one of this year's nominees with a rotten, rotten tomato score, yet it also got named as one of the best movies of the year by the American Film Institute. So as you can see, it's just all over the place. As for me, obviously not only did I really enjoy this, but it was actually one of my favorite movies of the year. Now this one's interesting, as everyone here besides our main three characters are portrayed as these ridiculous, over-the-top caricatures, most of whom are not meant to be likable in the slightest. Yet, despite the ridiculousness of the situations in which everyone plays these mental gymnastics to get around talking about this comet that's 
about to kill everyone, it's the sort of thing that can scarily ring true to real life. Now, some people call it too heavy handed, and I understand where that criticism's coming from, but for me, the balance of over the top silliness and real life parallels was a nice mix, brought to life by an all star cast, with my two favorites being Jennifer Lawrence and Jonah Hill. I know Adam McKay has proved to be a divisive filmmaker since pivoting to more satirical films, but this has me looking forward to what he has next up his sleeve. At number 2, Licorice Pizza, the second most divisive film of all these nominees, though that's just more with audiences, as critics mostly praised it. While admittedly it's not always the most comfortable film, given the nature of the relationship between our two leads, I thought Paul Thomas Anderson did a fantastic job providing us insight into emotional immaturity and how we sometimes struggle to completely get it together. And he does so through this nice slice of life lens that also serves as a celebration of the 1970s. There is a somewhat loose structure to the film that gives it almost this vignette like feel. And while it leads to not always the most high stakes moments, I still found it endlessly entertaining. Anderson's screenplay was sharp as ever, while Lana Heim and Cooper Hoffman were two compelling leads. And I actually wish Heim made it in as one of the best actress nominees. And the film was often hilarious, with Anderson's usually witty banter placed in between a a lot of fun scenes featuring cameos from the likes of Sean Penn, Bradley Cooper, and many more. This is another knockout of the park for PTA, and this is another one that was easily one of my favorite movies of the year. But in first place is Coda, the coming of age film that might play into some familiar tropes, but does so with such a wonderful sincerity that it is near impossible to resist. This is the definition of a crowd pleaser, with a nice message about following your dreams and having to make sacrifices to achieve those dreams being told through a mix of humorous banter, as well as heartwarming family drama. A big part of what makes this such a joy to watch are the performances. Amelia Jones is absolutely fantastic here in a truly compelling lead performance, while Troy Kotzer and Marley Matlin are excellent in the supporting roles, along with Eugenio Derbez providing some comedic relief as the music teacher. This also works exceptionally well, as due to its subject matter, it gives way for much more visual storytelling, as we get most of the emotions through characters' facial expressions as they communicate through ASL, and it makes so many of the exchanges resonate so much more. In particular, a sequence towards the end on the back of a truck. It might not reinvent the wheel, but honestly, I loved every minute of it. It's funny, heartwarming, wonderfully acted, it's completely sincere, and it's my favorite of the 2022 Best Picture nominees. But that's it for my Oscars rankings. Hope you enjoyed the awards this year, though in the meantime, let me know. What's your ranking of the Best Picture nominees? Did you agree with this list at all? Did you disagree with it? Let me know in the comments below so we can discuss. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please give it a like and share it. And for more movie reviews and film discussion, please make sure to hit that subscribe button to stay updated. Thanks for watching everyone and keep having fun with film.